Lord, send out your Spirit and renew the face of the earth. Lord, send out your Spirit and renew the face of the earth. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord, my God, you are great indeed. How manifold are your so Lord, the earth is full of your creatures. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. If you take away their breath, they die and they return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit of love, they are created in your sight. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. May the glory last for all time. May the Lord be glad in his works. Pleasing to him will be my feet. I will be glad in the Lord. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the Hey friends, welcome back. I'm so glad to see you. We are starting a new series today. It's called God Made the Whole Rainbow. And it's all about how God loves variety. The rainbow has lots of colors, right? It's not all purple or all blue. No, God loves having all the colors together because the differences in the colors make the rainbow so much more beautiful. And that brings us to our first passage we're talking about. Are you ready to be totally surprised? It says, on one occasion, while Jesus was eating with his disciples, he told them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you in a few days will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Hmm, how can you be baptized with the Spirit? John dunked people in the Jordan River. So, how do you get baptized in the Spirit? That must have been really confusing. And they were probably confused because then they asked kind of a strange question. They said, um, does this mean that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay, that was kind of a funny question, right? Going from baptism to kingdom of Israel. Well, here's the thing. They had a long, long history of having Jerusalem being the most important city, the holy city that had the temple where they would go and worship God. And right now, in this time, their holy city was not doing well. And the Romans were in charge of them and they couldn't worship God the way they wanted and it was just not going good. And so they thought, well, if God's spirit is coming, then surely the temple and the city are going to be restored. They're, they're, it's going to go back to the way it used to be in the good old days. And Jesus says, no, that's not the plan. We're not going back to the good old days. I have a new thing coming. Hmm, they did not have any idea what was coming. You ready? I'm going to read to you. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were staying. What? And then they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. What? That is crazy. That is not anything at all like just restoring the kingdom to Israel like they expected. This is something completely different. Wow, what a major surprise, right? And why were they all speaking in other languages? Was it just a cool trick? No way. Here's why. They were staying in Jerusalem with all sorts of other Jews from every nation under heaven. Okay, so people from far, far away had heard about God, and they were also following God. And they heard this sound of all these languages being spoken. And so a crowd came together wondering what is happening because they could each hear their own language. They were so amazed. And they said, are not all these people speaking from Galilee? How do they know my language? They were from all over the place, and he gives us a really long list, which I won't read, of how many places they were from. And they were amazed and perplexed and said, what does this mean? What does it mean? Here's an idea. I think it means that God loves bigger than we could ever imagine. God loves the whole earth, the whole world, all of the countries, all the people, all the languages that they speak. God didn't say, all right, here's the deal. You have to learn to speak the language of the Galileans before you learn about me. No, God made the Galileans speak all the other languages because God loved these people so much. God wanted them to hear in their own language that they grew up with and they understand best, in their own language, how much God loved them and all the amazing things that God did through Jesus. That's a bigger love than the disciples could ever have imagined. They thought that this was going to be centered in their own important city and God said, no, no, it's for the whole world. Wow. Isn't that an amazing, wonderful surprise? that God's love is bigger and more powerful than they ever knew. We have way more surprises coming up. Are you guys ready for it? I can't wait to tell you all about it. See you next week. Bye. A reading from Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. A reading from the 13th century Persian poet Jalal Adin Muhammad Rumi, a poem called The Guest House. Listen for its invitation. This being human is a guest house, 
every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Well, welcome to this sermon series that we're calling The Gift of Discomfort, Living into Wholeness in Hard Times. These are hard times, and therefore, there's a lot of discomfort. We also realize, as we, your pastors, were reflecting on texts that would help us as people, that the Bible largely was written in times of great discomfort, and that the Bible has been cherished by our ancestors who found wisdom in the Bible during their times of discomfort. And so this series of sermons is going to be more of a conversation between the two of us, with you watching in or listening in, about these readings from a section of the Bible called the Acts of the Apostles. Pastor Unbi and I are going to explore the ways the book of Acts is a witness to the boundary crossing, the bridge building, healing ministry of God through the Spirit, who is always working toward reconciliation, healing, and equality in our world. Today's sermon we're calling Disruption, because it's about Acts chapter 2 and Pentecost, the disrupting presence of God who comes in the form of holy wind and holy fire, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And so we invite you to join us in this conversation about the way dis the discomforts that we often feel, especially in these days, can become gifts and how we can, through the gift of discomfort, learn to live more fully into wholeness, even in these hard times. So as we begin, let's start with some simple observations about the story. Unbi, I wonder what, as we've read this together, stands out for you from the book of Acts? Yeah. What stands out for me is that the people heard the good news being spoken in their own language. And the text says that, you know, there are people from every nation uh, passing by and they stopped because they were bewildered. And this reminded me of a time when I was also bewildered by an experience that I had at a predominantly white church in Atlanta. This was back in 2014, and it was the first Sunday after I had tearfully said goodbye to a Korean congregation where I'd been serving at the time because it became apparent that they would not ordain me. They were part of a denomination that ordained women, but it seemed like it was just too much trouble for them to make that ordination service happen for me. So I felt really sad to leave that beloved congregation. I dreaded the thought of visiting new churches where I knew nobody, but I managed to drag myself to a church. I remember sitting in one of the back rows, it was a small, beautiful church, and I was surrounded by many gray heads. And I sat there, of course, I was a minority, there wasn't, there may be like one or two Asians and everybody pretty much white. And I wasn't quite sure what I, how I was going to feel about this church. And the choir stood to sing. And as I began to sing, I kind of was like, uh, in the story of Acts, bewildered. I perked up in my seat to study their lips and strained my ears. And Chris, these white people were singing, what a friend we have in Jesus, in Korean. Oh, my goodness. So 
a part of me was laughing because it was just so unexpected and um, uh, I had never seen white people singing a Korean hymn. But at the same time, I choked up with emotion because I felt the spirit speaking to me at that moment saying, and me, see, you're not alone. It's gonna be okay. And what a friend you have in Jesus. You know, at first I tried to, I wanted to go church hopping, but I, after that, I kind of went back to that church week after week. And that congregation welcomed me with open arms and organized and held an ordination service for me after knowing me for only a few months. It was not a perfect congregation by any means, but they proclaimed the good news to me in my language. Not only in the Korean lyrics of a hymn, I mean, that's relatively easy to do, but in their welcome and use of their position of power and resources to affirm God's call on my life when others felt like they didn't want to go through that trouble. And frankly, I experienced a similar thing at DCC. When I interviewed here, I fell in love with the church, but I told Chi, which church would take that risk and wait for months in uncertainty, trusting that the spirit was calling someone who is not a US citizen to be their next associate pastor? I had already experienced several interviews where I was the top candidate, but when push came to shove, when they knew about the visa issues, they went with the other candidates. So I did not have high hopes for any church to make that difficult decision. And I told she, it's, it's gonna take a miracle. So when DCC decided to commit to what they felt was the spirit leading us to each other, despite the uncertainty and the extra work it involved, I heard the gospel more clearly than any other sermon. And you know what I love about that is that actions can speak more powerfully than words. I, I sense that this is what what Pentecost is about, the action of God in the world. And I love the story because it's, it's a modern Pentecost story, you and two congregations, you in this hard time searching for a way forward. And here you found a church that embodied the gospel in such a way that you heard the good news in your own language. And I too am drawn to these these metaphors, these symbols of fire and wind. And I think largely because they're such powerful and potent symbols throughout scripture. I think of wind and fire and the way that they were present in all their powerfully disruptive and frightening ways in the story of the prophet Elijah. Elijah had escaped a brutal killing attempt by a tyrant king and he had fled into the wilderness. He eventually found himself on about, back on Mount Sinai after 40 days of wandering. Sinai is the place of divine revelation where Moses once was. And there, Elijah hides inside a cave. And then God shows up after this long period of waiting. Who knows what it must have been like for him in quarantine, locked up inside a cave, so to speak, out of fear. And God shows up as wind, fire, these symbols of enormous power, wind, fire, and an earthquake to encourage the prophet and to send the prophet back into the chaos of the times he was living through. And there he bore witness to God's vision for human life. So it helps me to remember that there's always this powerful, largely invisible presence with me and with all of us, especially in the hardest times of life. So like Elijah, in the cave, the early Christians huddled in a room somewhere in Jerusalem. They were scared, they were depleted. And a train has about ready to come by. <laughs> pause. Well, let's just pause and wait. <laughs> <laughs> the disruptions. <laughs> the disru but yes, a disruption. So it helps me remember that there's this powerful presence with me, with all of us, even in the hardest of times. 
Elijah was in a cave. The early Christians were huddled in an upper room somewhere in Jerusalem, scared and depleted. And I often feel this, and people I know right now feel this. And so what I appreciate is the way in which the biblical text explores the realities of human experience and it faces them honestly. That life is messy, painful, disruptive, and that God meets us precisely there yeah. in those places. I wonder if you can also speak to that other part of the story where there is the wind and fire and earthquakes and there's that disruption. But eventually, Elijah meets God in that stillness and silence. So can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that's important because sometimes we look for God in the big and the spectacular. And so in some ways, it's not surprising that God shows up as fire and wind and earthquake. But in that particular story, and maybe it was because of the state Elijah found himself in, so depleted, mm -hmm. that the Bible tells us that God spoke to Elijah, not in the wind, not in the fire, not in the earthquake, but in the still small voice, or as some translations put it, in the sheer sound of silence, which of course is no sound at all. So God meets us there in that place where we may be most bereft, uh, most empty, most silenced because of the pain around us or the fear that we encounter. When we first went into quarantine in March, some of us were talking about this as a time of a, a great pause, a hinge. We couldn't do anything. We were all on lockdown. And then the protests erupted after the killing of George Floyd. And of course, George, George wasn't the first. There are many black men and women who've been killed but something with George Floyd's killing broke the camel's back. And then there was that incident in New York City's Central Park when Amy Cooper, a white woman who was filmed calling the cops on Christian Cooper, who was no relation to her at all, a black man, merely watching birds in the park after he asked her to leash her dog. For so many of us, it was such a clear and tangible example of white privilege, the ability for a white person to simply call in the cops with a threat. Now we're in this angry time, this divisive time, this scary time in so many ways. And so I'm now calling this a great turning, this great hinge time. And this is the way I think Luke sees it. The coming of the Holy Spirit is this great turning when there's fear, there's division, there's anger, and the Holy Spirit breaks into all of that with this great disruption called Pentecost. Mm -hmm. and for me, one of the things this means is that we're not alone. We're never fully abandoned. We may not be able to see God, but God is present with us. And the Bible symbolizes that as fire and wind. Mm -hmm. and of course, I love that in Elijah's story. God also shows up in the sound of sheer silence. What really resonates for me from what you said is that we are not alone and that the spirit enters into our pain and is on the move. And I'm reminded of the way that God was present to the pain of the Israelites when they were enslaved. God tells Moses, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people. I have heard their cries of distress and I'm concerned about their suffering. And God enters that suffering through Moses who feels really ill-equipped hates public speaking, and doesn't want to be involved. And the story reminds me that even when the spirit is stirring, that process will be messy, and we may not always find ourselves willing. And I love the story of Elijah, who is just my favorite cranky prophet, because he's incredibly burnt out and depressed. He accuses God saying, I've done all these things. Where were you while the world is on fire? And these are just real feelings of resentment and exhaustion, which I'm sure many people feel. And then I see how God lets this tired prophet sleep for days and feeds him and reminds him that he needs food for the journey too, for the journey will be long. 
And he also, and God also reminds Elijah that he's not the only faithful prophet out there. There are other good people engaged in this work and that he's not alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that really connects with me because the journey is long. We're in the middle of this pandemic, this vitally important uprising, this continual struggle to care for the earth in the midst of climate crises. The journey's long. And it can feel too long. And when we find ourselves, and I experienced this myself and so many people I talk to, uh, in these hard times, we tend to cocoon. We isolate and, and, and we also then assume that we are the only one who thinks this way, the only one who feels this way. So the key thing for me is this takeaway that you mentioned, never alone. And then this, this press of the Holy Spirit, which moves us from our, our own isolation to get back out into the mess. Mm -hmm. So the stories we're reflecting on remind me that God has always been in the mess. And with human help, God has always brought something new out of the mess. Mm -hmm. That's something I can trust in now. That's something we can trust in now. Like Elisa Stone, our minister of congregational care, often says, and I like to quote her frequently, we can do hard things. Mm -hmm. That's what I think this text largely is about, at least to me today, living through these times. What's a takeaway for you? Um, I also am reading that we are never alone, and I love how the Spirit of God is always finding new ways to enter into our pain, and how God wrestles with all kinds of people. So I'm encouraged that God is still at work with all the Moseses out there who are hating all the changes, who wish they could just hide in a hole and be left in peace. I get that. And I'm encouraged that God is so tender and loving caring for the Elijahs out there who are exhausted, burnt out, and feeling alone. I, you know, I'm thinking about a lot of the parents that are receiving notices about um, how their children will continue remote learning, and then some other parents who need to send their children in like unsafe conditions, and I, I, that's been hard on, that's been heavy on my heart these days, just how exhausting that must be, just any, none of these options are good, right? So mm -hmm. thinking about that and holding them in my prayers. And I just, I think Elijah is a good reminder for us, for me at least, that yes, we are not alone, but we definitely need to take good care of ourselves. And when we are ready, get back out there into the mess, into what God is calling us. And finally, I'm thinking about what it looks like for me and for our church to share good news, not just in a language that is comfortable and familiar to us, but what, does, what really hits home as good news for those who are different from us? And that's the, that's the press of Pentecost. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit to help us do that. And we don't quite know how to do it, but the good news according to the book of Acts is we don't have to know in advance. The Holy Spirit will show us the way. And so friends, Unbi and I have been talking a lot about the text, reflecting a lot about the text, and now it's your turn. In the silence that now follows this message, we invite you to ponder, to listen, to inquire of God, to trust that inner impulse of the Holy Spirit to suggest things to you and to guide you. You might in, turn the device off, put it on pause for a few moments, and do some journal reflecting or talk with the people right next to you. What did you hear? What came to you? What troubled you? What disturbed you? Or what comforted you? So now is your time. And may the Holy Spirit be with you and with us all and with all creation to move it into the wholeness. It is God's holiness for us and all things. We'll do the same thing next week with Acts chapter four. Let's go into silence.
Dear God, open our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes. Your word is for all and your Holy Spirit connects us and unites us to those from similar backgrounds and experiences, to those with starkly different origins and drastically different upbringings. All are valued and all are made worthy through your deep presence. Your presence brings us hope and consistent comfort. Your presence brings us guidance and will never leave us alone. Your holy presence will not abandon our souls. Allow us to open our hearts, making room to listen to your divine spirit and holy wisdom that may come knocking when we least expect it. Allow us to hear the deep stirrings within us. We pray for our world, ravaged by injustice and corrupt leadership. We pray for our community in desperate need of positive change. We pray for our personal lives, burdened with uncertainty and inconsistency. We pray for essential workers, decision makers, and loved ones. We pray for all who are sick and weary, lonely and afraid, outcast and disregarded. Make your love apparent to them, O Lord. Now you may offer your own prayers. We pray for members of the congregation for continued connection between us and that we are able to find support and hope within our church community during these challenging times. Now take a moment to offer your own. Lord, we lift up these prayers to you. Continue to remind us of the unpredictable nature of your spirit. Continue to show us the ways in which your soul unites us and enable us to listen and learn from the experiences of others filled with your openness and love for all. Now let us pray a prayer together as one people, a prayer similar to the one Jesus taught his disciples. Ground of all being, mother of life, father of the universe. Your name is sacred beyond speaking. May we know your presence. May your longings be our longings in heart and in action. May there be food for the human family today and for the whole earth community. Forgive us the falseness of what we have done as we forgive those who are untrue to us. Do not forsake us in our time of conflict, but lead us into new beginnings. For the light of life, the vitality of life, and the glory of life are yours now and forever. Amen.
Janice Cook, Chair of DCC's Children's Ministry. As we begin the stewardship campaign for Davis Community Church, I will give you a brief moment for mission from our ministry with children and young families. I am encouraged that during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have continued activities, albeit with some changes. I'll mention four of the key ones. First are weekly emails that connect families and kids with announcements and resources. Second, the MomSense Small Group is now meeting online. It's a place for moms to share experiences and form friendships. Third, Church Day Camp happens next week. Kids will participate from home, but they will view the same recorded video content and have an activity pack that we have given to each child. As for past summer camps, DCC and other Davis churches collaborated for registration. Kate is providing much of the video content. Fourth are our Sunday school classes for preschool through sixth grade. They happen by Zoom. This is an example of what our gallery view might look like on any given week. Classes are about 40 minutes long. And they include a lesson, discussion, song, laughter, and some silliness. It's fun. I'm grateful for the hands and the funds that have enabled programs and outreach to continue. Specifically, we appreciate our small group of volunteer teachers and helpers for the preschool through sixth grade program. We also appreciate funds for curriculum, staff support from Elisa, Kate, and Unbi, and our nursery caregivers. Looking for forward, I am hopeful. In social distancing, the children and other families are continuing to be involved through Sunday School Zoom and other programs. And there is room for this ministry to grow. Specifically, we are looking for new hands and hearts to make this happen. Our volunteer group is small and most have served for years. Consider joining us and spending a bit of your time with these wonderful kids. It's the most hopeful thing of all. Thank you for your time. Please join me in this prayer of dedication adapted from Walter Brueggemann's prayer, Yes. God, you have said yes to us in creation, yes to us in our birth, yes to us in our baptism, yes to us in our awakening this day. But we confess that there are many things that hold us back and make us prone to live our lives not back to your yes, 
but more of an endless perhaps, maybe, we'll see. So we pray for your mercy this day, that your spirit would transform our fears. Help us discern between real and imagined scarcity. Help us experience the joys of living in trust and generosity. Inspire us to be wise and fearless stewards, that we may live yes back to you, yes with our time, yes with our money, yes with our strength and with our weakness. Yes to our neighbor, yes, and no longer perhaps. In the name of your enfleshed yes to us, even Jesus, who is our yes into your future. Amen. Fire can warm us, but also waste us. Wind can refresh us, but also wreck us. The fire and wind of God is strong, but always good, always for healing, always for reconciliation and wholeness and the unity of all. May the fire and wind of the Spirit disturb what stands in the way of what is good and true and beautiful. May the fire you feel in this hard time and the wind that moves against your face be for what is good and true and beautiful. May it be strong enough to move you, gentle enough to heal you, and constant enough to grow you into the greening of your humanity and the maturing of your divinity in Christ, who is the one who makes us whole. Amen.